Well, if uh, many of you all are like me, you had a pretty exciting week this week because it was the first week of college football. I mean, really, the first real week. And there have actually been a couple of really good games that we've already gotten to enjoy. Hopefully, some of you all got to enjoy college football yesterday. Hopefully, some of you all got to see Dion, right, and his game. How cool was that? So happy, happy for him. Um, yeah, give him a hand. What a you know, wonderful turn of events for him. Uh, that's that's got to be the biggest game played so far. And I say so far because we all know that the really big game happens tonight, right? And uh, that's the game that we're all looking forward to. I, I've been anticipating, Kez McCorvey and I were talking earlier, um, and uh, a couple, I don't know, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, actually, and he asked me, he said, are you looking forward to the college football season and to the FSU-LSU game? And I told him, I said, I've been looking forward to this game for nine months. You know, as, as soon as the schedule ended, the last season ended, I've been looking forward to it. And I don't know about you, many of y'all probably that way, you look forward to the game tonight. How many of y'all are nervous about the game tonight? You've even got a little bit of, yeah, hands are going up. I got it. A little bit of anxiety. It's that, that do I really want to tune in and watch this, or, or do I want to just te- check the scores on my phone? Can I, can I bear to watch? Kind of thing, right? You know what I'm talking about? And it's like, why am I nervous? I'm not playing. You know, I'm not doing anything. It's not, not like my anxiety changes the outcome of the game. Or some of you all those kinds of people, right? Oh, don't say that. You'll ruin everything. If you say that, they'll start losing. Really? Or if I start watching, they'll start losing, right? You know what I'm saying? Anybody like that, right? Why are we anxious about something that we anticipate like a football game when we aren't even the ones who have influence over what's going on, right? Now, think about somebody who actually plays in the game. They've got a reason to be a bit anxious, don't they? I mean, they've got something on the line. Uh, a really high-end football player knows what it's like to have some skin in the game, right? Knows what it's like to anticipate something really, really big like an important football game. So as we were thinking about this a few weeks ago, a few months ago, uh, I just thought it would be good if we had somebody who had that kind of experience, that had the experience of anticipating a really big game. And so today we're going to be joined by Kez McCorvey. Kez was a receiver here at Florida State from 1990 to 1994. Kez played in that 1993 championship game that a lot of people think was one of the best games we ever played. And um, he caught five passes for 70 yards in that game. I looked that up, Kez. I did not just know that. Okay, which is really crazy good. He went on to be, yeah. Kez went on to become the fifth leading receiver in Florida State history, went on to play in the NFL for the Detroit Lions. But more important than all of that, Kez McCorvey is a brother in Jesus Christ. So we all welcome Kez to the platform. Kez, I'm so glad that you're able to be here today. Thank you, sir, for coming, for your willingness to come and serve. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Man, and, and so, Kez, you've been serving with FCA here in North Florida. You're the, the area director. Yes, sir. Uh, how long have you been doing that? Uh, going on seven years. Seven years. It's yes. a long time. It's a big investment in the yes. ministry. And you've seen God do some amazing things, I'm sure, in that seven years. <laughs> yes, it's been awesome. I, I came in with a little expect, ex- expectation, and God has delivered more than I can ever imagine. Oh, fantastic. I'm so glad that you're here and that you're a part of that ministry. Let's talk a little bit about the game tonight, though. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm excited. you excited? You see these shoes right here? There you go. <laughs> I've got to get me some of those, man. Those are fantastic. I, I know you're looking forward to it. Are you just watching at home with friends? How are you taking no, it I'm gonna go. I'm going to go to the game. You're going to the I'm game? I'm going to the you game. You're leaving here and going to the game? Yes. Man, I did not know this. Thank you for being here today. Yeah. Like you, you cut us into your weekend. Hey, we go, we gonna go. That's pretty good stuff. You know what it's like to anticipate what the kids who are playing tonight are anticipating, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of preparation, a lot of uh, work that's been put into this right here, and then for themselves too, they have dreams and aspirations of great things as well. You were telling me earlier when we were talking about today. Mm-hmm that one of the things that makes an investment into something like this possible for players and coaches is the culture on the team. Yeah, yeah. What makes a really good culture? Uh, you know, what really, a really good culture is made 
you know, from start to start from the coaches and the leadership. Leadership creates that. But then the, you know, the culture has to be not a self. It has to be selfless. It has to be team other oriented. And that's the biggest part of a culture that is going to be a great culture. Because if you're selfish, right, you think about yourself, you won't do what it takes, what's necessary to, to, to be successful. And so that's a big part of the culture is having a selfless, uh, a not me culture to where you can give, you're willing to give whatever it takes to be successful. And when you think about the teammates then, and you're talking about how they can't be selfish, they've got to, you know, come at the team with a team mindset. What does it take to be a really good teammate that distribute dis, uh, d- displays those kind of qualities? You know what? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta love, you gotta love your teammates more than you love yourself. I, I know when I played, I felt like you know, I, I was asked to do things that I didn't like to do. I was asked to play in the slot. I didn't like to play in the slot. I want to play on the outside, but I did it because I love my teammates. I did it because I knew if I sacrifice. We had a chance to be successful, and so that's that's the that's the that's those are the qualities of a great team. They sacrifice and they value others more than they value themselves. When you play football, it's a violent sport, yeah. and there's all kinds of trash talk and so forth, yeah. both in practice and at a game. Words can hurt, can't they? Yeah. How is it that your teammates' words brought you down? How was it that your teammates' words brought you up? Ooh, we, that's, that's, you know, you, you have those guys that don't, I think, don't understand, you know, how to be a good teammate and how to value your other teammates and how to speak life into people. But then you got those guys that do know how to speak life. I just remember, I'm going to go back to a game a bunch of years ago. We played in the 94, 1994, we played in the game. It was the greatest comeback in the history of FSU football. And I recall... <laughs> And I recall two of my teammates, as we were down 31 to 3, I recall them having a conversation. And one of my teammates, Devin Bush, said to Derrick Brooks, he said, let's make it respectable. And I overheard that. And what it did to me is it brought to life kids hope. All right, keep fighting, kids. And because of their words, their conviction, and their heart, it, it rubbed off on me. And then I went down to the rest of the way on the other side over there, and I, com- and I went and I encouraged my rest of my teammates. And, from that, you know, you go on to score 28 points in 10 minutes to win a game. And so, I mean, to tie a game. And so that's what, to me, that the power of the encouragement and having a, a great voice, a, a, a great voice, a great teammate in the huddle does for you. Now, you told me, you mentioned before that when you came here, you wound up playing slot. Yeah. And you didn't like that. No, I didn't like that. You told me when we were discussing, <laughs> you were like, I don't want to be a slot receiver. I want to be a, a big time guy. Don't <laughs> yeah. make me some possession receiver. You were frustrated by yeah, that. Yeah, because possession, cold word possession receiver means slow. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's, you know, you can say it all you want, but when you say possession receiver, you really cursing. You really, you know, you're selling a curse word. That's a curse word to a receiver. <laughs> and so I didn't like it, right? And then when you play in slot, you get you you're next to the linebackers. Those are the guys that hit hard. The safety <laughs> and linebackers are the guys that hit hard and try to and try to hurt you. And so I didn't like that. So I didn't want to be in there. But you had to show. But the coaches were like, you know, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And you said you went on. It, it turned out to be a good thing because you wound up being wildly successful. So yeah. it took from you getting the news that you were going to be a slow possession receiver yeah. mm. <clears throat> to you being wildly successful. That took a measure. Of patience. Yes, it did. It took, it took faith. I remember Coach Bowden said, Kez, you're the over-the-middle guy. I said, no, Coach, I'm not the over-the-middle guy. I'm the post guy, Coach, the reverse guy. No, Kez, you're the over-the-middle guy. <laughs> but from that, you know, I, by me doing my job, it allowed everybody else to do their job. Ward Gunn got more opportunities. Tamari Bano got more opportunities. The other guys around me got more opportunities because I was able to do my job. And so I did my, I felt like I did my job to the point to where at the end of my career, I became the second all-time leading receiver in, in yards of reception. And I would have never thought that. But by me sacrificing, God gave me more than I expected. So while you were showing the patience mm. with the assignment you weren't crazy about, yeah. you were also working really hard. Those two things came together and it equaled success for you. Yeah. It was a big deal. Let me ask you, what coaches stood out to you as also being patient? Oh, my good. I had a bunch of, you know, I think the coach is one of the most powerful persons that we have now, I, uh, especially in my life, too. My, I've had great coaches. I, I've had one of the greatest coaches in, in the history of college football. And I recall a coach told to me one time when I was trying to get into coaching, he said, Kez, you might be too nice to be a coach. And I thought to myself, hold on a second, how can you be too nice? First of all, I just saw the greatest of all times do it that way and be successful. That can't be true. 
And so I've had great coaches. I had one that's here. I was sitting by him a second ago. There he is. He's behind me. <laughs> but he, he, he used to come and he recruited me. He would sit in that car and he was the nicest guy in the whole world to me. He loved on me, encouraged me. And I had a bunch of guys that, 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 that program that encouraged me, that, that gave me the confidence to move forward. But my, my favorite coach, and forgive, forgive me, coach, my favorite coach was my first, my little league coach. His name was Eddie Trammell. He was my t-ball coach my first year. And he spoke life into me. You know, a young boy that didn't have a father and was looking for some, some, somebody to pour into him, Eddie Trammell spoke life to me. He would encourage me, all right? And he would love it. And he didn't, he didn't have to say it with his voice. He said, he said it with his eyes. His eyes, every time I saw him, spoke love to me. And I wanted to, I wanted to please him. And so that made me fall in love with sport. Let me ask you, and he's standing behind you, okay? <laughs> and I know that he wasn't, you know, responsible for your offense. He's defense, but was Mickey a patient coach? <laughs> hey, hey with, with me, he was. With me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first, I got to tell you a quick story about coach. My first week there, right, he recruited me, so he's kind of responsible for me, right? And so, and so the first week of camp, I'm doing pretty good, right? I'm beating some of his DBs, and so he's getting mad. Ah, get out of that back on that field. Yeah, right, 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 right. And, then he, and he saw me, he said, Kev, you're doing a good job, buddy. Keep going now. <laughs> Kev, would you join us? Would y'all welcome Mickey Andrews? Now, if you know Florida State, you know that, yeah, let's step up a little bit into the light a little bit better. Uh, if you know Florida State football at all, you know that Mickey Andrews was a legendary coach at FSU for an awful lot of years. You might not be aware that he is also on the board, the local board for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so I invited him, yeah. So, Coach, I invited you to be with us this morning and ask you to pray for Kez and pray for FCA. Will you do that for us? Would you give the microphone there? Before uh, we pray, let me just mention one thing <clears throat> about Kez. <laughs> I learned a long time ago, Steve Spurrier taught me, don't ever follow him. Or, excuse me, always follow him. Don't let him go first. So, but anyway... Uh, I go over in, in South Mississippi and visiting with uh, coaches over there at Pascagoula, and they had a little wide receiver. Uh, I thought he was just half-timing it all the time because he couldn't run very fast. <laughs> and I could not get Coach Eason, our receiver coach, to approve him because he couldn't run. I said, John, he can catch. And to me as a defensive back, and I think this is the way I would recruit offensive receivers. Number one, will he block? They don't get the ball thrown to him about four or five times a game. Number two, will he catch it? If he you'll throw it to him five, five times and he drops it two or three times, what have you got? I don't think I ever saw him drop a ball in practice or in a game. And he's the only person I can say that, that I truly believe I never saw a drop a ball during his career at Florida State. He's a special guy. And I never knew at the time that bringing him in that he's going to end up being my boss. <laughs> but the Lord has really blessed him. He's, he's blessed uh, this area by putting Cash here. He's a great human being and, and I, I would like for you to pray with me for kids. Uh, so let's just bow our heads. Father, we do thank you for this day. We come before you with grateful hearts. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord. Uh, as we went through the hurricane this past week, Father, you spared so many of us. We did not have a whole lot of damage and did not lose lives like we expected. And Father, we, we know now that there are some that were affected by the hurricane. Lord, just please be with them, be with their families. Some of them don't have anything. They don't even have a home. But they do have each other. 
and to do have that opportunity to fellowship with you. So we just pray, Father, that you would bring healing, that you'd bring encouragement, that you'd bring restoration, and Father, just help them to realize that uh, he is still in control. Help us to realize that. I pray now for Kez as he goes into service as leader of our FCA group in Northwest Alabama. Well, he, he needs your help. I pray that you would give him that help. Help those who are working with him to, to provide that help. Well, we have such a great obligation and such a great opportunity to affect lives. Uh, some, some of us didn't make those decisions to become Christians when we were young. It's so much easier, if, if Lord, if we can reach these kids, if we can build trust and confidence in them that, that your way is the best way. Father, I just pray that you would be with us now as we go through the rest of this service. Prepare our hearts to receive your word and your truth so that we can better serve you. Amen. Amen. Would you all thank Mickey and Kez as well? All right. Hey, listen, uh, go ahead and open your Bibles. And then as you're doing so, open your Bibles to James 5. And as you're doing so, I just want you to think a little bit back to what we were talking about there with Kez. As he talked about anticipating big moments in his life, whether it was, you know, when he came to Florida State uh, and Florida State was the only school that recruited him and he was frustrated because he didn't get to play the position that he thought he would, you know, would get to play. And he's had to deal with all of that kind of struggle and goes on to see amazing things happen in his career. As he anticipated that, he had to demonstrate tremendous patience. He had to invest in things like culture. He had to invest in things like preparation. There's an old cliche we hear in sports almost every single time an athlete, a football player in particular, is interviewed. They always say, well, you just got to control what you can control, right? It's just such a cliche, isn't it? And yet all of those things were absolutely mission critical for Kez to be successful, for other athletes to be successful, regardless of who wins tonight, if whoever is successful, they've had to demonstrate things like patience, preparation, determination, right? You get it? Now, you think about it for a moment. Think about us as followers of Jesus Christ. What is the greatest moment that we have to anticipate in the future? What's, what's the paramount moment? I would, yes, exactly. The return of Jesus Christ. Nothing in all of the human experience can compare to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus promised that he would return. And we see this anticipated throughout Scripture. We see in places like Daniel and 2 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Peter and Revelation, the Bible all points forward to this, to one day history as we know it will come to an end and a whole new era of eternity will begin under the leadership and rule of Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about this in places like Matthew 24 and 25 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. And Jesus is very clear that he is on a mission to redeem what has been lost through the devastating impact of sin. And it is his mission to bring everything back to God and to bring it all back in its rightful state. And we know that one day Jesus will return and he'll redeem what was lost to the fall and he'll destroy all competitors to God's dominion, authority, and power. And Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And the book of Revelation teaches us that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The old will pass away. And those who love Jesus and who have accepted his incredibly generous offer of grace will live and reign with him forever. You all, I just want you to stop for a moment and imagine what is in store for those who love the Lord. It is an incredible, beautiful thing, is it not? To just think about it. And I anticipate that day. And I hope you do as well. So... As James is writing here in James chapter 5, as he's writing to the church, he talks with them about what they need to be doing as they anticipate 
the day of the Lord. And I just feel like it's important for you and me to understand this as well. As we continue on, if you're, if you're new today, we're in the midst of a study on the book of James. We've got a couple of weeks left, actually. So let's look at it in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Here's what James says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. <clears throat> Let me ask you uh, just real quickly, how many of y'all love to be patient? <laughs> That's what I figured, okay? <laughs> Patience is hard, isn't it? It's not easy to be patient. Just think about what we mean when we talk about being patient. Patient means being patient is the ability to handle a delay or setback without losing it. You all know that my family and I got to go and, and be together in Colorado uh, just a couple of weeks ago. It was great. On the way out there, our plane sat on the, on the runway for an hour in Atlanta with our baby grandson, right? That was so much fun. <laughs> it was such a joy. It was such a great opportunity to be what? Patient. I was like, man, I am not going to lose it on this airplane. There are too many stories in the news about people losing it on airplanes. I'm not going to be one of them, right? Then on the way back, on the way home, we get, as we're driving into Denver, Colorado, our phones start blowing up. Your flight has been delayed. Your flight has been delayed again. Your flight's been delayed again. You think your flight was delayed before? Wait until now. We get to the airport. Our flight's been pushed back all the way out of the window for us to catch our flight from Atlanta to Tallahassee. So we got to wait patiently, right? We get to Atlanta, of course, the flight to Tallahassee's already left, and so we got to go spend the night in a hotel, which was great. We got to be in the hotel room about three and a half hours, which was awesome, right? That was our night's sleep. What were you doing? We were waiting how? Patiently. We don't like the idea of waiting patiently. But James says, listen, while you're waiting for the world to be transformed by the return of Jesus, you need to wait with patience. That's how you need to wait. And then he's going to go on. He's going to give us two examples of patience. One of them is one that I think that some of us in the room can identify very quickly with. The other one, a little bit of a stretch, but let's go there and let's enjoy what he has to say to us. Look at James chapter 5, the rest of verse 7. Take a look at it. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the earth, the early and the late rains. You see that? First thing he says is, hey, listen, yeah, you, while you're waiting for the Lord, you need to wait patiently. Let me give an illustration of uh, someone who knows patience. How about a farmer? Now, I know that Tallahassee is not much of an Aggie town at all, right? Uh, this is one of the only churches I've ever been around. I think we've got one Aggie in the church that I know of. We just, it's not a farm community at all. But let me tell you, I've had the opportunity to serve around farmers. They are some of the most patient people you will ever meet in your life. They are also some of the most hardworking people you will ever be around in your life. And it never stops for a farmer. In spring, a farmer is busy getting the fields prepared, planting seed. In the summer, he's busy cultivating the crop. He's busy protecting it from pests. In the fall, he's harvesting. In the winter, he's repairing equipment and get ready to do it all over again. There is never a moment when a farmer isn't hard at work. In fact, if you show me a lazy farmer, I will show you someone who is starving to death. James says, listen, you and I have got a job to do while we wait for the return of Jesus Christ. And it's incredibly hard <laughs> You know what that job is? Be patient. And be patient like a farmer. So we don't just sit around doing nothing while we wait for the Lord to return. What are we doing? We are doing our job. We're recognizing that God is going to do what only he can do. He's the one who's going to make it rain. He's going to make the sun shine. He's got the whole process of germination and all that all worked out and figured out. He set it all into motion. Those are all things that only God can do. And there's nothing the farmer can do except to wait patiently for those things to occur. At the same time, what are they doing? To use the football expression, they are controlling what they can control. They're working incredibly hard. They're making sure the equipment's ready, the ground's ready, the seeds are planted. It's all there. We want God to deliver for us on our timetable to do what we want to do when we want it done. Waiting patiently is really hard to do. It's no wonder in verse 8, James says, strengthen your hearts. 
because it takes a certain measure of fortitude to be patient. And that's the kind of patience we're supposed to show as we wait for the return of Jesus Christ. We do not let anything separate us from the love of God. We stay on mission doing what God has commanded us to do the entire time that we wait. And it's hard because there's every measure of adversity, right? So if, if your marriage begins to falter, what do you do? You stay on mission. You do what God has told you to do, right? If your family falters, what do you do? You stay on mission. You do what God told you to do. You love your family. You relate to your family with that kind of passion, If your church falters, if the economy falters, if your job falters, through all of it, we stay on mission and we patiently control what we can control. We do what God has given us to do. That's patience like a farmer. Then James comes along and he adds something else to it. He says, not only do you need the patience of a farmer, you also need the patience of a prophet. Now, this one's a little bit more of a stretch for us. We don't really think about prophets in our world today like they were back in James's day. But look at James chapter 5, verse 10. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You've heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. I want you to think for a moment about a prophet. <laughs> okay, Think about Jonah, for example. A prophet is given a message from God and the mandate to carry that message to the people. God does not stop and ask the prophet, hey, do you like this message? (laughs) He's just given the message. And so then the prophet, if he is obedient, goes, he delivers the message. People are going to receive it. It's going to be all over the map. Sometimes they like you, sometimes they don't, right? They deliver the message and then they deal with the reaction as people respond to God's message. And it's not their fault. Remember the expression that we have, don't shoot the messenger? (laughs) That applies here. Don't shoot the prophet. He's just the one delivering the message, right? You remember Jonah, for example. Jonah did not want to deliver the message that God had for the people of Nineveh, right? He ran in the other direction. And God said, no, you're going to deliver the message. That's your job. I'm responsible for the content. You're responsible to do the work. And James says, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got a job to do until God says the job is done. You may not understand everything that's going on. It may involve some suffering on your part, but still, you've got to do the job, so be patient. And as we anticipate the coming of the Lord, which is the greatest moment in all of human history, we've got to show the patience of a farmer. We've got to show the patience of a prophet. We've got to work incredibly hard. We've got to control what we can control. And we've got to wait on the Lord to do what only he can do, right? So that's sort of what the internal workings of patience looks like. But that's not the end of what patience is about. See, patience isn't just something that I do on the inside of me. It's not just a matter of self-discipline. It's also something that I show to other people, isn't it? And so James picks up on that. Look, jump back to verse 9 for a moment. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. James says, listen, patience looks an awful lot like not complaining. I love that because that's a really low bar. And you can just imagine James is looking at this church. He's kind of frustrated with them. And he says, quit complaining and just be patient, right? And there's a lot of truth to that. It sounds simple, but Galatians chapter 5 tells us that patience is one of the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, to be patient and to be patient with other people, to show patience, is a byproduct of the Spirit of God at work in our life. It does not come naturally. It's an outcome of what it means to be in a relationship with Jesus. And so when when we show patience to other people, it completely changes the way we relate to them, doesn't it? Because instead of complaining, right, instead of being critical of them, I have to invest in them. I love Romans chapter 15, verse 1 here. Now, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. I would submit to you that's a pretty good example or description of what it means to show patience to somebody else. 
We bear their weaknesses. We put their needs ahead of our own. We build them up. And that's exactly what James has in mind here. Because the capacity of the church to truly fulfill the mission of Jesus Christ will require that we work together in unity. And there's no way that you and I can do that with patience. Now, look back there at the verse for a moment. How does James describe the opposite of patience? Complaining, right? That's sort of the opposite. Growing impatient, being that that complaining and critical person. And he says, listen, if you go down that path, here's what's going to happen to you. You'll be what? You'll be judged. And I would submit to you, that's a pretty full statement right there. Obviously, there's, there's an, an eternal component of that, right? There's also a here and now component of that too, though, isn't there? Let me just ask you, if you're frustrated with your spouse and you complain to your spouse all the time, are you going to be judged? Oh, yeah. If you're frustrated with your children and you complain all the time, will judgment come for you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. If you're frustrated with your boss because you think you can do your better job better than she can do it, and you complain all the time, will judgment come for you? Oh, yeah. So this is, a, this is something that James tells us that's true in the here and now and true in the supernatural reality as well, okay? It has an impact on all of our relationships here and on our relationship with God. And so James tells us, you don't want to be found to be impatient with one another on the day that Jesus returns. Instead, be patient. Control what you can control. Trust God to do what only he can do and show patience and grace to one another. What should I be doing until the most anticipated day in human history? I should be patient. And patience is not easy. As I was thinking about today, I, I read all different kinds of formulas about ways that you can develop patience. As I went through different lists that I found from different authors, I thought, yeah, that's all really great. But at the end of the day, most of them were pretty discouraging, right? Let me just give you one, one truth to take home today as you think about developing patience because I really... At the end of the day, it really comes down to one simple principle. Patience is about valuing what God is doing more than you value what you are doing. Patience is about valuing what God is doing more than what you are doing. Let's just imagine for a moment there's somebody in your life that keeps letting you down and you are out of patience with that person. Sound familiar? Maybe that's your reality right now. Here's the thing. You have to remember that God is at work in the life of that frustrating person right now in real time. God is at work in that person's life. The whole aim of the gospel, the whole aim of the gospel is to to see people redeemed and restored and into a right relationship with God. And you all, that is transformational in the life of anyone. That's the whole point. And God is in charge of that process. My job is not to be the Holy Spirit for that person that's frustrating me. My job is to patiently do, my, do, do what I can do in their life, right? And to trust that what God is doing is far more important than what I'm doing. So I'm like the farmer. I'm like the prophet, right? I plant the seed. I give the good word, okay? But I wait on the Lord with great patience, God is the one who changes the heart. My job is to change my own attitude. And instead of complaining, to serve that person with great patience. So even when I'm at my end with somebody, I'm working really hard to control what I can control, which is myself. Jesus talks about being patient when it seems absolutely hopeless. One of his disciples, Peter, comes to him and he asks him a question, how many times should I forgive somebody, right? And you can imagine he's probably frustrated when he asks that because that's when you would ask a question like that, right? He's probably frustrated, okay? Look at what Jesus' response. And there were the whole interaction here, verse 21, Matthew 18. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I'll tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Just how patient do I have to be with somebody, Lord? Now, it's my understanding that back in that day, you were expected to forgive somebody three times, and after that, you could just, you know, be done with it. So Peter thinks he's already doing a pretty cool thing when he, you know, says, how about seven times? That's way more than the three that's expected. Jesus comes back and says, multiply that by 70, and you're getting somewhere. 
Uh, by the way, this is not a math puzzle that uh, Jesus is giving. What is that, like 490 times, right? I don't know. It's not a math. Am I right? Is it 490? Somebody? Yeah, okay, good. That was preacher on the fly math, so I'm going to take that as a win, okay? Be patient with my math skills, right? Jesus wasn't giving him a math puzzle, was he? His whole point was, your job is to be patient. Your job is to allow God to convict that person of the Holy Spirit. Your job is to speak truth, and your job is to draw some boundaries. Your job is to encourage and love and shape and point and do all that you can. And all that you can includes forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving while you wait for God to do what only he can do. And that's going to require real patience. It might be here that you're here right now and you're looking at me and you're thinking, David, you have no idea. I'm dealing with somebody in my life that's struggling with an addiction. I'm dealing with somebody in my life that's got a legitimate mental health issue. Do you know how hard it is to show patience? And I sympathize and empathize with you. I know it must be excruciatingly difficult. And yet as I look at the word of God, what does it call me to even in those excruciating moments? Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Trust that God is going to do what only he can do. And you may have to put some pretty firm boundaries in place in order just to survive. I totally understand. But you all, the call of God is clear. Be patient. And be patient in a way that it shows. Because what God can do in that person's life is infinitely more important than what you can do. And so you wait patiently. And you see what God can do in the life of that person. Years ago, I was in seminary, and uh, it, was, it was kind of interesting. One of my best friends from college wound up at the same seminary where I attended. This guy was gifted. He was, had tremendous communication capacity. He was winsome. Everybody loved this guy. He got a great job in a wonderful church uh, while he was in seminary right there in the city of New Orleans. Everything about his life was up and to the right. It all looked good, except he had a secret that no one else knew about. He was a high-functioning alcoholic. His wife eventually got tired of it, and one day she left him. It broke my friend's heart, and he made a decision. He said, I'm going to go to my pastor. Remember, he's on staff at this church. He was a youth pastor. I'm going to go to my pastor of this large church. I'm going to tell him about my alcoholism. I'm going to tell him about my wife. I'm then going to go home, and I'm going to kill myself. That was his plan. So he got in the car, he drove to the church, he went in, he saw his pastor, he said, I got to tell you something. He told him that his wife had left him, he told him that I've been a high-functioning alcoholic for a lot of years, and he said, I know that this disqualifies me from ministry, and so here's my resignation. And the pastor looked at my friend, and he said, well, Ron, what you've done might disqualify you from this ministry, but that doesn't mean we're going to give up on you. And the church paid for Ron to go to a residential treatment facility in North Georgia. And he spent months there dealing with all the fallout that his alcoholism had brought onto him. They showed enormous patience with him, didn't they? Did they draw some boundaries? Yep. Were there consequences for the behavior? Yep. But were they patient? Yep. You all, that was over 25 years ago. And to this day, my friend Ron works at that treatment facility, serving God in that way. All because God worked while people were patient with him. Some of you are at your wit's end right now. And you're thinking, I just can't take it anymore. James would say to you, As you wait for the return of the Lord, as you wait for the day when sin is no more and the package that is bringing you down is gone, as you wait for that day, can you wait patiently? Can you be patient with that person yet again? And I hope that for you, the answer is yes. Because one day Christ is going to return and it's going to be the greatest day in human history. And we don't know when that day will be. We just know that it will absolutely come. And our job is to wait patiently and to show that patience to other people. Our job is to control what we can control. 
and make room for God to do what only he can do. And I just want to remind you of one thing. For every single one of us, there is a central truth that is common to all. And that is this. God has been incredibly patient with us. Can we say amen? Amen. God has been incredibly patient with us. And if you're a Christ follower here today, you just need to remind yourself that you've experienced the forgiveness and grace of God. You've experienced his patience over and over and over and over again. And if we are going to look like Jesus, then we are going to have to reflect the patience of Jesus to others. And we're going to be wait patiently for the greatest day in human history because of what Jesus has done for us. Now, it may be that today it would be appropriate for some of us to dig down deep and say, Lord, will you please forgive me for my impatience? And just ask him for the strength to turn this whole situation around, to give you the fortitude you need to deal with the problems that you're facing, to move in the life of the person that maybe is breaking your heart. Maybe that's what you need to do today. And then maybe you're here today and you need to understand that you've not yet received Jesus. And you need to understand that all this time, all throughout your lifetime, he's been waiting patiently for you. Maybe today's the day that you say, Lord, make me one of yours. I'm ready. And today is the day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your goodness, your mercy that you pour out onto us. We see the effect of your patience. It's evident, and we thank you very much for it. And so, Lord, we just pray that today, if for those who are in this room and they're dealing with just incredibly difficult situations, be it at work, be it in their family, be it in their marriage, wherever it may be, that they just say, you know what, I'm going to show the patience of a farmer, the patience of a prophet, And I'm going to let that patience be seen by those around me. And I'm going to look forward to that beautiful day when the skies split and Christ returns and eternity begins. And then, Lord, for some today, the prayer is, God, you've been waiting patiently on me. Today's the day that I respond to it and just say, yes, I will follow you no matter what it takes. So, Father, hear our prayer, be it for patience, be it for salvation, and grant us the courage to take the next steps. We love you, Father. We pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, amen.